This is Tuesday, March 9th, 2021. Senate Judiciary Committee taking up S-25, an act relating to miscellaneous um, issues regarding uh, cannabis. Um, in preparing for today's meeting, I thought we would go over some of the recommendations from various folks who have um, spoken and wit who were witnesses on the commit to the committee, um, but also start by going through the bill and what we wanted to do. Um, I will say from the outset that the agriculture issues within this bill do not belong in this committee. Um, and that includes those suggested, you know, for example, um, <clears throat> by the Vermont Growers Association and others. It, it, it's just not um, issues that judiciary normally deals with. So um, I think this should be in the purview of the Finance Committee <clears throat> and the Agriculture Committee. So I've asked Michelle to draft um, a note along with the proposals um, that are in this bill that have to do with finance and have to do with agriculture and to um, ask the agriculture committee to look at those issues. Um, I just, I don't, um, I really appreciate the Growers Association and uh, Graham and Rural Vermont and other groups um, and their suggestions and just, um, I'm not used to talking about um, current use, and other things that are involved. I just don't think it's within the purview of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, so uh, the social equity issues, I think, are within our purview. Um, and, uh, government operations will have, I think, suggestions for us today or next or hopefully by Thursday. Well, we have some today that we've talked about and I think agreed on, and then we'll have, we're continuing the discussion. We'll have them by tomorrow, I believe. Okay, well, um, all right, so let's get started, um, starting to go through the bill. Um, not uh, starting on page two, regulation by local government. That's your committee, Senator White. Yes, and what we've done is we have, um, we heard that it, do you want the details of what we've No, done? I what? think it, if you're not gonna be ready, I mean, I think if we put it well, together. I think we're ready with this one. Do you have a, is there ability to put a copy on the? Um, I, I, can, I can send your amendment, um, to Peggy right now and she can put it up if you want to talk about that. I wasn't sure that the, I wasn't, I didn't realize that Senate GovOps had already signed off on those. So, but I'll send it to Peggy right now. Do you want me to do that? Sure. Okay. Uh, Peggy, I'm wondering where the uh, copy of the bill would be on the website. It's um, S25? Yeah, it's not under yeah. today's documents. No, if you go to the website. Yeah. Um, actually, let me show you guys how to do this. You already uh, did. Oh, <laughs> is this bills and no. Yeah. Uh, hold on. Uh, what happened there? Hold on. I don't know. We did it just. Um, it's not working. It's under bills it in the committee. Yeah, if you go to the committee page. Yep. And you go under documents and handouts. Yep. And then you go under bill. Uh, okay, got it. And then you go to S twenty five. Thank you. And then drafts, amendments, and legal documents. It will be there, I'll, and so will the RAM amendment be there. Okay, thanks so much. No problem. So, so right now, though, we're working off of the bill as introduced. Is that correct? So far, yeah. Okay, thanks. So but, uh, now, Senator White's got an amendment already to section. Well, do you want two, us to do all the all the amendments at the same time? I can give you just the the background of what this is. The VLCT felt that 2022 was way too soon because they won't even have the rules um, defined by then. So what we did is changed it and just said that 
is similar to the um, liquor vote that if you it just says that if you haven't if a town hasn't voted on it by March 2023 it'll be considered an opt-in town okay. that's essentially what it says that sounds like a good idea and it doesn't give any language that you have to use um, for your on your vote it just says that you ha if you haven't done it you're an opt-in and I emailed that uh, language to ev to everyone, to the committee, and also to Peggy, so Peggy can can post it. But it'll. Okay, that, 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 this is not the way I want to go through a bill. Okay. It's almost impossible. Um, okay, I'll look at this. Is the amendment that Senator White just talked about? This is okay. one of them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, on March eighth, twenty twenty three, we're fine with that, right? Yep. Oh, this is sorry. just the retail portion. What about those that have asked for integrated licenses? It it, it says it says it on there. It's the retail portion of the integrated license. Oh, oh, thank you. Okay. Second amendment is a new section two. That's the cannabis control board duties and members. Yeah. And what we did is um put, um, we took this out of the information that was given to us by, I believe, Gregory. I mean, Jeffrey, I, don't, I always want to call him Gregory, but it's Jeffrey. And what we did is um, the process that the, um, per, the a member can be removed by two members of the board or by a two thirds vote of the advisory committee. <laughs> we then um, requested that the advisory committee be seated, be appointed by April 1st, and that by April 15th, they are, um, uh, have been, had their first meeting. Because if they're going to be an advisory board, they need to be seated before the Cannabis Control Board gives us the reports, otherwise they're not advising on anything. Jeanette, can I ask a question? Or yeah. Senator Sears, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, is there any other board in existence that has this kind of arrangement? I believe we heard that the um, uh, PUC, was that what it was, Michelle? Well, Joe, what, what, with respect to what aspect are you talking about? What kind of arrangement? where there is no ability by the administration, for instance, to come in and say, we're gonna remove this person. They... Yeah, the, the Green Mountain Care Board. Oh, that's what it was. Okay. And also just to reiterate, but I know you guys are, are well aware of my office's position is that what you did in Act 164 with regard to the, the structure and removal process we feel is completely constitutional, well within your authority to do that. And that is, we differ from the administration's position that uh, they are saying, you know, they have consistently said that you can't do that, but we've, you know, we've, had that battle with them a few times, but just so you know, we feel as though everything there's, it's completely fine the way it is. If you want to add something here with regards to, if you want to change something, you can certainly do that, but that's a policy choice and not a legal one as far as we're concerned. Well, I think we've had this discussion before and I know the committee doesn't want to uh, design a bill based on whether the governor is going to sign a board or not, <clears throat> but I do know this provision and the opt in provision um, our sticking points for the administration. And I'm just throwing that out there because it's something that I know. I appreciate yeah, he that. Said that. We got the letter from Monica Hutt. But this is a recommendation of the Government Operations yeah. Committee. So I, I'm inclined to uh, go along with them um, <clears throat> personally. And we don't all have to. Um, but I think that if you wanted to have the governor be able to remove it, it would have to be for cause. Many of the governor's appoint the governor's appointees, he can just remove. But 
it it would have to be for cause. You can't just have it at the whim of the of the um, administration. Yeah, I agree. Next, we have section two is integrated licenses. So we can we accept that part of the strike all will be the government operations draft one point one. Well, the Michelle, does this include all of the things that we're going to talk about this afternoon? No, this amendment is just the first things that you sent me that you wanted me to put in an amendment. All the okay. other issues you wanted, you were going to discuss and then yeah. decide on, and then I would draft and incorporate. Okay, um, got it. So, okay. so, Dick, so Dick, you're back on S25 is introduced and looking at that yeah. section two for integrated. Section two, yeah. Right. So is government operations going to have suggestions on that? On the integrated licenses? Yeah. Um, no, except that um, we are we are looking this afternoon at um, the suggestion that came from in um, Representative Chinas about the Cannabis Business Development Fund and the develop the um, starting that up, and that was what Philip. That was what I suggested we. Um, take a one-time advance and put in there. And then the uh, dispensaries have suggested that they take three, that into that fund would go 3% of their sales up to $50,000 for the first six months to um, put into that fund. Um, and so we were gonna take up that issue this afternoon, the development of the fund and then the um, money from the, from the dispensaries or the integrated licenses. All right. Um, the, uh, the only thing I care is that this was something the governor mentioned that I've mentioned, and we changed the board shell to May. Um, I don't know if um, Virginia Renfrew has any comments on that or anybody else in the audience who would like to comment. There is so I'm I'm getting lost because the draft keeps disappearing from the screen. This is no longer the draft. Now no, we're back under, to the bill. Understood. The the second half of my confusion is okay. we have we have we're talking about discussions that have yet to happen and then some drafts that have come in in partial form. So I'm I'm getting uh I'm getting confused about what we're adding to the bill because it's okay. It seems a little premature. This is not, this was actually in the bill. Okay. Um, so section two had to do, the original section two of the bill. Yeah. S25 has to do with integrated licenses. Mm -hmm. And the change is there shall be not more, that the not is a change, than five total. And the other change is the board may issue rather than shall issue. Okay. Yeah. An integrated license to the applicant. <clears throat> Virginia Renfrew is representing the um, the dispensaries, medical dispensaries. I didn't know if she wanted to comment on that change. And then I was going to offer an opportunity for anybody else who wanted to comment. So it was one of the things the governor raised in his non-signing message. And the concern was expressed by some of the witnesses that integrated licenses could lead to big, um, big cannabis. Um, and that, that's what has happened in other states. And it's something that I think we've all agreed we want to avoid. Is that, I mean, I'm going back to the bill now. Hmm. The Senator White's finished with her. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we we're we haven't looked at set, section two at all. We're not going to. <laughs> that... So, uh, Dick, I'm just wondering. I have from Michelle in my inbox. I have this amendment. Um, is that what we're talking about, or are we talking? No, about... we're talking about the bill is introduced, page five. Okay. Um, at the line two. Change actually line two and three, change the shell to a May. Is 
the idea there as we introduced it, and I, Michelle can explain what the background is for that. But again, going back to the governor's non-signing letter. So that one, so uh, Senator Sears is right. It's just changing it so that the board has discretion to issue the integrated rather than that they're required to issue the integrated if they meet all the criteria. Um, one thing that's just important to note is that you you can't if it's if it's discretionary and you don't know how many if any that they will issue then um, that potentially um, eliminates the early rollouts of sales because they're the ones that start selling in the spring as opposed to the retailers in the fall. So you wouldn't have any, if you if you did that and then the board doesn't issue the integrated, um, you could potentially just wind up with no tax revenue coming in until October instead of April of that year. And so you don't have an early rollout in that situation. So you have to think about how that affects your finances. Um, it also means that the small cultivators that are licensed at the same time in the spring um, won't be able to sell to integrated because there won't be any integrated. So um, it it does change the dynamic of the rollout and how and how fast any cannabis or cannabis products get to market. Mm -hmm. oh, if we, is that clear? So. It's a policy decision. Mm -hmm. And I've, Virginia and Jeffrey from the Vermont Growers Association would like to speak. Is that okay? Or do you want, do you have further questions, Bill? Senator? Uh, I did have one quick question for Michelle. Yeah. You, you, you said it would change the, the timeline. Uh, is it fair to say it could change the timeline because you could still have? Um, mm -hmm. It's it would it's discretionary. So right now, the way that it is is that if the dispensary if a dispensary applies and they meet all of the criteria and the, uh, for everything, that then the board would yeah. issue, it shall issue them the license. Um, the it just changes it to discretionary, so they 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 can or they can't. So we we don't. It's it's possible it could mm -hmm. go on and all five. I don't know how many would apply, but. Um, it, it could roll out like originally intended as passed last year, or it could be fewer um, than anticipated, or it could be none because it's discretionary. And there's no basis, there's no standard in there for, the, for deciding whether or not to grant it. It's just, you can. That, that would be my question. So could, could the control board say, we think there should be fewer um, integrated licenses. So we're only gonna take the first two that apply. Would that be in their purview to-, to Sure, limit? yeah, there's no basis for them accepting or denying it if they meet all the criteria. So they could do what they want. Yeah, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, um, just wanna make clear, this was the governor's recommendation. Uh, Senator Benning and the other sponsors the bill put it into the doesn't mean we have to keep it. I can check with the numbers from JFO before if you if people No, I think I'd really okay. rather hear from Virginia and, and Jeffrey and then anybody else on the call who would like to speak. Virginia. Good morning, Senators. Thank you very much for having me here. It's good to see you all. Um, so I'm Virginia Renfer. I represent the Vermont Cannabis Trade Association, which consists of the five uh, medical cannabis dispensaries. And, um, you know, we would prefer that the shell remains. Um, we, you know, the dispensaries would love to, you know, be a partner with the state and be able to roll this program out uh, sooner than later. And by leaving the word shell in there, it gives the dispensaries the ability to know that they will be licensed and they can start to um, you know, increase their uh, production as they get closer to being uh, licensed for this. And I think also the fact of for the small growers, 
Um, the dispensaries, you know, definitely want to partner with the small brewers. They support the language in S25 around the 25%. Um, and, you know, to be able to start uh, to sell, you know, obviously the timeline here has changed, but, you know, if they could start selling, you know, May or June, um, it will be bringing revenue into the state to help to pay for this. And I think it's important to know that none of the dispensaries want to be a monopoly within the state of Vermont. You know, they want to be part of this. Um, they recognize that in order for really the medical program to continue to survive, that um, they uh, need to be in the tax and regulation um, field. So, um, you know, we, we definitely would prefer that you keep the word shell. We understand, you know, the governor was concerned about that, but um, we think it would actually benefit the state. Thank you. Questions for Virginia? Jeffrey, thank you for being here this morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, morning. Good to see you again. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, thank you, uh, Senator Benning and others for bringing up these amendments and, um, and trying to meet the governor uh, in his concerns that he expressed last year. Um, as you guys know, um, Vermont Growers Association, I'm the executive director and we're part of a, a larger coalition. Some of my colleagues are on the call right now. I see Mark and, and Graham from rural Vermont. And we are here to um, help make sure that these inequities get addressed this year. Um, specific to uh, the shall and mm. licensees, my question uh, was, uh, and, and it may have been answered uh, through uh, Michelle uh, of Ledge Council, but and others who had commented. But we were really wondering to speak from the small business, the farmer, uh, and the entrepreneur aspect of this industry, which Vermont Growers Association represents. What? What do you guys uh, anticipate uh, materially changing for us um, if this were to uh, become law? Um, and I say that with some context and that is, I understand Senator Sears and thank you chairman for bringing uh, up the fact that um, our ag amendments uh, are not um, appropriate for this committee. But I do wanna mention uh, to speak to uh, the governor's concerns, which you raise as intent for this, this clause, is we, we see the matter as uh, a licensing issue. And so that is why we uh, do propose um, licensing reforms, what we call equitable licensing. So whether or not this is the committee to be considering that, please note uh, that is how we uh, address those concerns that we're trying to meet now. Um, so I did want to mention that. Um, and very briefly, since uh, Virginia brought up uh, the notion of small businesses being able to sell to these integrated license holders, that is in the law. Um, we do, from our own constituency, think that there may be some Vermonters who will do that, who are in that position to be doing that at that time but we think a majority of the small businesses and the illicit actors will not be interested in uh, lending their craft, their hard work product to be sold on the shelves, even if it's just three months, a couple months, uh, in, in one of these stores that, you, you know, uh, to be frank, can be, can be visited elsewhere. Uh, a lot of these large retailers, and that's fine, there's a place for them in this business, they have stores in Massachusetts, they have stores in, in Maine and elsewhere. So we're looking for uh, Vermont brand. Uh, we're trying to transition Vermonters into this market. Uh, and so uh, I want to uh, remind the committee of the realities of um, contract growing and how that did not work out so well for brewers in the 1990s. So we think it's a not, not, a, not, not a problem to be transitional, but don't, re don't rely on that for uh, for any sort of um, uh, robust uh, involvement from small businesses. So, thank you. I, okay. I, um. So 
Can I just add something? So, so it. Yeah, I'm would... confused. If you before you add anything, I'm a little confused. Can I ask Jeffrey a question? Sure, of course. Thank you. Uh, what you're looking for is the licensing um, regulations and um, including um, that was uh, section two of this amendment. Uh, small uh, the, regarding the small growers licensing marketing equity and scale appropriation regulation correct for instance one of them would be an integrated <laughs> license for farmers themselves okay so you'd like more than just you'd like a lot you'd like <clears throat> more than five integrated licenses different types of licenses uh, we, we, uh, so, so not entirely, uh, we, we suggest defining other licenses as S54 or Act 164 does suggest, for instance, craft delivery and whatnot. And it does allude to the CCB developing these licenses. What we're suggesting as an organization, as a broader coalition is we've defined them now. We understand that this this will meet the uh, inequity and equality concerns that the governor addressed. So now would be the time to take it up. We've gone through uh, the research and the study of examining other states and determining what we think is best for Vermont. And so that's what's in our proposal. Thank you. Michelle, you wanted to say something? I just wanted to clarify that, um, that the the small cultivators that would be the under 164, if you um, don't have, so as Jeff, Jeffrey was saying that he doesn't think that many would sell to an integrated licensee or a dispensary as provided in Act 164. So that means that those people that wouldn't would have to wait till the retailers are licensed uh, after October 1st. So the cultivators the small cultivators that you granted an early access to licensing, if they're not gonna do that, then they're not gonna, I mean, I guess they can go ahead and get licensed, but they're not gonna be able to sell product until the fall, so. I think I understand that, I'm not sure. <clears throat> All right. Uh I mean, I'm, I'm looking at his licensing market equity and scale appropriate regulation, one of which is to um, allow outdoor cultivation, um, caps on production, craft licenses, et cetera. Um, Senator Sears? That's where I'm totally out of my league. Can I ask a question about that? My understanding is that um, we can put a lot of detail in here, or we can tell the Cannabis Control Board that they should be looking at um, craft licenses. And I, I actually prefer a CSA model so that a um, farmer can grow and sell to a limited, they won't, wouldn't need to have a retail license because they're only selling to people who've signed up with them like a CSA. But I guess my concern is that if we put too much detail, I, I don't know how much detail we should be putting in here in terms of the licenses and what they mean and when they're, when they're granted, or if we should um, put that the intent is that we, um, honor the small farm and the small growers in Vermont and leave that to the board and the advisory committee. Well, all right. Well, I think we should put something in here that uh, the very least, um, unless you're, are you doing the licensing part? We weren't going to. Well, I think we should put something in here that allows them to grow outside. I don't think we should have all operations. Small. Oh, I, I, I agree with that. I thought you were going to send that to, to egg. Well, you know, so, they're allowed uh, to grow outside. Yeah. Now under current law, they can grow outside. 
the suggestion here, I think, was that anything that's grown outside is be, con be considered an agricultural product. And I'm not sure that I, that I necessarily think that's a good idea because that means there's no zoning, no, um, no restrictions on it. So, but they, they can grow outside. Yeah, and yeah. And there's a suggestion here that the caps, that there be caps, but at different caps for outside growing and inside growing and mixed light. Well, growing. that's what I need agriculture committee to look at. Okay, thank you. So can I also just, I just wanted to direct y'all to, there is um, a provision in Act 164 that specifically directs the board to report to you next January recommendations as to whether the General Assembly should consider adding additional types of license, cannabis licenses, including a craft cooperative license, a delivery license, special event license, or others. So you guys did, um, because you had been talking about those other types of licenses um, the previous few years, and you chose not to do it in Act 164, but you did ask the board to consider um, the potential expanding of additional licenses. And so they're supposed to report to you on that already. Okay. I'm, I'm into, uh, Graham, do you have a comment? I just Thank saw you, your hand. I'm sorry, I, did, I missed your hand earlier. No, that's okay. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm here just trying to feed my daughter and listen at the same time. Um, so I just wanted to provide a little clarity and speak to what um, Senator White just said as well. So it's just specifically, you know, the licensing if, if you felt like you weren't able or didn't have the time or ability to want to put in all the details that we suggest here, and um, I agree, we would love to see this in agriculture. Um, hopefully we can get it there and we can have a more nuanced conversation about some of these details. But, you know, if, if ultimately none of that turns out to be possible, you know, one possibility is going in the direction, I believe, of what Senator White said and more being more specific about what we direct the CCB to do. So it would say that we could say something that's similarly to, to the extent of the CCB um, shall um, create a licensing structure which differentiates between, defines and differentiates between indoor, outdoor, and mixed light, which differentiates different scales um, with different regulations associated with them and different costs um, associated with them, which, um, you know, has production caps for all scales of production in all types of business. In that way, they wouldn't just be sort of left, well, we can do it if we want, but they'd be directed and said, you all have to take, you all have to these details you have to create this sort of equitable playing field that involves scale, it involves indoor, outdoor, mixed light, um, it involves probably differentiation of fee and differentiation of other types of regulation. I, I really appreciate the idea around a CSA model you brought up, Senator White. I think that's exactly sort of what we're talking about from the fall, small farm perspective is the reality of a lot of small farms is we don't rely, we can't make a living on our wholesale prices. And I think especially in this market, we've seen in other states, the commodification of cannabis really <laughs> affects Ability of small people to exist in the market. So what way are, ways are there for small producers to have a direct relationship with the consumer, which we currently all rely on for selling vegetables, in my case, beef, um, et cetera. So I just wanted to quickly comment on that. And just give you an idea of that other, you did mention the integrated license that we, we suggested, Senator Sears. And all that is essentially something similar to what Senator White is talking about, wherein, whereas it allows outdoor cultivation, processing product manufacturing and retail sales only on farm and only from product produced on farm, which is essentially what farmers are currently allowed to do for things they produce on their farm. And we understand that there's concerns around nuisance and around security and stuff. And that's hopefully what we could all talk about in committee when it gets to the ag committee as well. But I just wanted to comment there and um, <clears throat> I think I'll leave. The, uh, I'm gonna leave it to Senator White if you wanna throw, put this in, I'm fine. With oh, okay. We could, we could, um, I actually think that the language that Graham was just using about the direction, instead of trying to be specific about the, the uh, production caps and the everything is being <clears throat> specific to the Cannabis Control Board that they need to look at this and they need to look at all these things in conjunction with it. So if you want us to do that this afternoon, we can do that. I appreciate that. Okay. Senator Baruth has a comment or question. Uh, I would just say there's a difference between what Jeanette just said and what Graham said in that I heard him say he wanted us to say that the control board shall create this structure. I think 
Senator White just said um, that we would direct them to talk about it. I, I'm more comfortable directing a discussion and a decision from the control board because we haven't taken enough testimony for me to vote knowledgeably on a shall create this structure. Um, personally, that's my opinion. They have to come to us anyway, right? Yeah. Afterwards, yeah. Well, your committee will decide whether to recommend a shall or may. Okay, I'm writing that down. Wow. Graham, <laughs> did you want to comment again? I saw your hand up and I don't know. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Senator Bruce is, is correct that, you know, my, my point was it would be directing the Cannabis Control Board to specifically make those changes. And again, it wouldn't say that they have to look like this or they have to look like why, but it says you have to make them based on scale, based on these definitions of indoor, outdoor, mixed light. Um, and the reason we prefer that as opposed to what the alternative, just saying you must discuss this, is because we really would prefer to have these conversations with an elected body about the details if they're not going to be required. <laughs> You know, if they're not going to have to have to create these structures, we just think it's going to be much harder for us to you know, have those conversations. I know, honey, with a three-member board um, that's as opposed to in committee with folks. And this is Juniper, who's providing testimony as well. <laughs> you yeah. heard her. Yeah, I, I, I agree with what was she that said. Was that in favor? <laughs> She's supporting everything I'm saying. She's very emphat emphatic about it. <laughs> We, we say that something passes without objection. That's clearly an objection. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm, I'm good with leaving this to uh, government operations to give us some. Um, okay. Um, as well as whether or not should be a may. Okay. Oh, on. I mean, on shall. That. Well, the issue is that there's okay. two issues in this um, section two. One is the word not. There should be not more than five. Mm -hmm. um, and the other issue is, should it be a shall or a may? If it's a may, then it doesn't have to have a not. Or you could have it both. You, you could, no limit on integrated licenses, mm -hmm. um, which would set us up one more thing. But um, I'll leave that to your committee, Senator. All right. Thank you for the volunteering. But I, I do. So section three, actually, I wanted to talk about section. Um, jump to page six, where um, between August 1st and October 1st, 2020, 25% of cannabis flowers sold by integrated license should be obtained from a licensed small cultivator. You want to look at that too as part of? We, we, we can. We thought that um, the only thing that might need to change there is if available. <clears throat> yeah, but it, it, that would be also the ag. Uh, once we got something a shell here, I hope the ag committee will look at it. That's tied into uh, the integrated. So if they're right, yeah. So they do kind of go together. Mm -hmm. The next is the social equity, which is section three. <clears throat> um, I think. And Mark can correct me if I'm wrong. I think one of the recommendations was to have no licensing fee for certain, rather than reduced. And that's in section 3A. And then in, in B, and then we come to uh, Representative Chinas and, and Senator Rahm's amendments dealing with issues. Nice question on A. Are you, are you leaving A, Senator Sears? No, no I'm, I'm, I'm asking a question. Which is which? Is a in section three. A in section three. Yeah. I'm mm -hmm. just wondering, um, with regard to the line, who historically have been disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition. So does this include um, persons who resided out of state during that um, period of time, or are these people 
um, supposedly impacted in Vermont or can they be impacted in another state and come in and start, start here? As I read this, they could. Um, <clears throat> there's there's this no definition. Yeah, go ahead, Michelle. I was just going to say, so this is the term that's used a few times in Act 164, and that, uh, but there is not a definition of that. And so the way that it's currently structured, it is up to the board, probably through rulemaking, that they would be um, identifying how they uh, determine uh, individuals who have historically been disproportionately impacted by cannabis. There's not a specific statutory definition of that. So. so so I guess I'm thinking about the board and all these pieces they have to address. I mean, might they not miss that? Um, it seems like it should be a little more specific, but I think Jeanette had said at one point that Illinois had something, some guideline. No, what I said is that Illinois had good, um, uh, and Michigan also, I believe, and Massachusetts had good um, language, but their rollout and the implementation um, what, from what I've heard was not ideal. And I think that this is, I think this is something that the board really has to grapple with. And I was reading, if you read um, Representative China's um, proposed draft, the, the impacted area is all of Vermont actually. And, but it doesn't, it isn't just Vermont. It's anywhere in the, in the world as it looks like. Um, because it says any as determined by the United States Census Bureau. So it could be anywhere in the country. And then um, he has um, members of any impacted family are considered disproportionately um, affected. And th that means anybody who had a parent, guardian, child, spouse, or dependent who was arrested for or convicted. I have to tell you, I know a lot of people who were arrested for marijuana in the 60s and 70s who are not disproportionately impacted individuals. They came from wealthy families. They, um, there is no way they should be considered um, there. So I think that the board has to really look at much more detail around what this means. That's my my thought. I mean, I would certainly think so too, because it looks like what what is proposed here will be wiped out, perhaps by others who aren't the intended. But no, so I want to consider. I want to actually revise it so that I'll listen to Mark on the. But but it should not be just reduced fees. To, there may be people who can't afford a fee who would be better off. Um, so I don't think it should be just a new space. It should be considering no fee there in the board's recommendations. Mark? Okay. You have your hand up. Mark Hughes? Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for the invite, um, Peggy and Mr. Chairman, and good morning, uh, committee, and other guests and colleagues from the coalition. I think that um, where I wanted to start with um, the um, just the observation that I have here is is just a um, just a um, a thought is is I'm, I am a little um, no. uncertain on um, how to straddle these committees uh, to get the work done, but I appreciate uh, the invitation of both committees and. Uh, um, and I appreciate you, uh, Senator White, for uh, the work that you've done on this uh, so far. Um, the um, the other th the other thought that I had is is that there was there was a some significant recommendation that was put forward by uh, the working group of the Social Equity Caucus, and I was wondering if the committee had taken uh, testimony and, and or taken into consideration any of that. Um, uh, and then uh, regarding the um, recommendations uh, for amendment that were put forward uh, on my last visit to you, uh, they were just that, 
um, I think um, Senator Benning, you asked emphatically, are these recommendations for amendment or are these recommendations for, um, are this, uh, is this a, uh, a um, introduction of a bill? And I uh, replied that it was both. So it is now H414, I uh, have it in front of me right now. And um, these uh, recommendations are uh, to Senator uh, Nitka's uh, point, uh, directly reflective of the language of Illinois, uh, much of the policy of Illinois that really sought to address the um, the um, racial and social equity uh, aspects of the policy. I think that um, when I left the committee last, um, I was expecting that there would be all or some of the uh, recommendations that were put forward that are contained here in H414. Uh, uh, at least uh, for a record uh, for uh, amendment um, or at least uh, submit them on the appropriate place on the website to indicate such, but I haven't seen any of that. Um, so um, as far as the, um, the definitions are concerned about the um, um, identifying, you know, who, um, would be considered disproportionately impacted. And otherwise, um, yes, there are um, uh, areas that are uh, identified. Um, there are also family members that are identified as being impacted as well. Um, and there are an array of different other definitions uh, that refer to um, what would ref what would be uh, considered a qualified social equity applicant. And I think that, that at the end of the day, that might be at the heart of what we're looking for is, is who is a qualified social equity applicant. So there are an array again of definitions that I sought to bring to your attention for, I, for consideration for implementation um, amendment implementation to clarify uh, some of this uh, confusion that goes with who is qualified. And I think that um, beyond that, I think just in practicality and just in acknowledgement of what some of us believe to be in existence of uh, this thing called systemic racism, uh, I just want to just flag that um, that in um, you know how we um, how we have, have approached this is is that um, we've sought to um, identify folks as being impacted not solely because they were incarcerated because what we know and understand and this is the appropriate place to have that conversation in Senate Judiciary is is that. The impact of the a um, an encounter with the so-called criminal justice system uh, creates uh, concentric circles, uh, not just across the person's life, but across the person's family, and sometimes in perpetuity, and then even generationally. Um, and and that crosses state boundaries. Hard stop. So I know that is hard. It's it's easy to. Um, create policy uh, in a vacuum, but we can't do that when we do it, when we're having conversations about uh, how systemic racism has impacted, um, you know, people of color. This is just from our, from my perspective, from our perspective as an organization, because the vast majority of us come here from other states. Um, so, um, that would also hold true in our health system, which was designed not to deliver health care in a consistent or fair manner. Um, and But yet and still, we bear the burden of caring for the people of the state of Vermont, no matter where they come from. And I think that we could say the same thing about housing and education and employment in across all other sectors. Um, and one thing holds true, and no well, matter how you gonna, look at it, is is that? No, thank you. No, go ahead. Did I interrupt? I'm sorry. I, I was just I was just uh, 
I thought you were going to say something. I, one of the things that we have to look at is is, is simply that um, <clears throat> this state is ninety four point five percent white, and it and it used to be more white. So these policies, if we view these policies in a manner in which we're taking into consideration what has come, who has come from out of the state, I think we, we're doing a lot of folks a disservice. Um, in fact, the vast majority of you didn't come from Vermont. <clears throat> so um, when we go to um, the policy uh, itself, uh, it, 25, I want to just um, go back a little bit, Mr. Chairman, is and talk a little bit about the additional uh, responsibility that the um, that the committee, that the Cannabis Control Board rather, uh, has concerning the um, the work of equity, uh, and in that um, there is a responsibility that. Again, as we go back to this language, historically, individuals who have historically been disproportionately impacted, page one, line, line 13, uh, 14, 15, um, this is a responsibility that's being placed again on the Cannabis Control Board. And I think this really echoes uh, the concern of some of the folks who are um, communicating uh, the, you know, this, these ag issues is, is that there's an awful lot that we've you know, placed on the Cannabis Control Board. And I realized that this is a tough policy to put together. Um, you know, and there, there, was, there was some, um, there, there's quite a bit that the Cannabis Control Board is gonna have to carry when it comes to equity. That's when it gets challenging. And if it's a matter of process, I can understand uh, wanting to offload or for lack of, I should say a better term would be to delegate uh, with the responsibility to report back uh, some of these very important responsibilities. But when it comes to equity, <clears throat> those responsibilities, I believe, should rise to a level that we address them as early out of the gate legislatively as possible. Because what we see and what we know is, is the more discretion one has in these areas, the more difficult it is to achieve equity. So I implore you, if it's possible, to um, Senator uh, Beirut, I see, I see your hand, I'll yield. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if, if I might. No, go ahead. Uh, I agree with you, Mark, and that's why when we talked about this the last time you were with the committee, mm -hmm. um, it seemed to me that the language in Representative China's bill could inadvertently produce a result where the great majority of people who were helped by the language were not the community you're referring to, but instead, um, you know, other people who had been maybe narrowly impacted by the war on drugs, but not as directly. Um, and that, that goes to the fact that the language in Representative China's original bill didn't refer to race. It referred to um, people who had been uh, socioeconomically impacted within a certain geographic area. And it seems to me that if we don't want to repeat the experience in states that Senator White mentioned, that we should be more directive about what we mean Otherwise, you know, it's possible to imagine 94.5% <clears throat> of the money and the resources going to um, white Vermonters uh, who may be part of a far flung network of people who were impacted by the war on drugs, but we wouldn't be addressing systemic racism as you're talking about it. Um, so can you, can you help us in that way to because I, I think one of the issues we're coming up with is specificity. And I remember uh, Skylar Nash in his testimony urged us to speak directly to the, to the, to the issue of race. How, how should we do that? Could, could, could I throw something in here for Mark to also consider when he's talking about this? Uh oh, okay. that... one thing to consider, I better start writing. <laughs> so oh, I, uh, I, yeah. Alice is, 
Senator Nitka's question about <clears throat> um, if this would be from any any place, and I I think that it's clear if I under, remember it from Act 164 that you have to be a Vermont resident in order to um, get a license. That doesn't mean that you couldn't have come <clears throat> from someplace else and been impacted there, but you currently have to be a Vermont resident well, as I remember it. Yeah, but, okay. Um, no, no, that's Michelle's not. Michelle's so, disagreeing. I, we so thought I think, that was unconstitutional, I think. Um, okay, but I think I'm we want to make it correctly. pretty clear then that um, in my opinion, and maybe Mark, you can um, think about this also, is are, are we going to give preference to people who are, who have no, no ties to Vermont at all, but just see that they can get a reduced fee or a loan here, but have no ties as opposed to people who actually are here and I don't know how how you do that if it's unconstitutional so but that is something that no no I think I think what we determined was it would be unconstitutional to say that nobody from another state could get a license here yeah I I don't know that it would be unconstitutional to provide certain um benefits to Vermonters that oh. are available to non-Vermonters oh and okay. you do you do do that in 164 that's you what I thought. You provide technical well, assistance. I, I think, yeah, we could, we could provide a benefit to Vermonters from marginalized communities. Yeah. It's how you define marginalized communities. That um, yeah. is my worry looking over age 414. And I, I will be honest, I don't know that we have the, I mean, I don't, this, unfortunately this year, a lot of bills have come late and hard to, you know, deal with it in seven days, believe me. So, um, Mark, um, I believe the, okay. the, the question, the question from Senator White has been answered. Yeah. It's, I think Thank the you. question is how best to define a marginalized community or community <clears throat> member without, without, um, yeah, I guess that's the question without insulting anybody. Right, right. I, I appreciate that, um, Mr. Chairman. And before I speak um, about him, I should go ahead and acknowledge him. Um, um, Senator Benning is, is trying to get in the call in the yep. conversation. Senator Benning? Yep. Mark, you used um, the word emphatic about my, my last conversation, and I think mm. you were kind. Mm. Um, I was exasperated, actually, because this is a heavy issue, mm -hmm. trying to deal with it under what could be considered an arbitrary date called crossover um, is very difficult. But I <laughs> wanna give you um, my thoughts in hearing what Phillips offered uh, direction was. I personally was arrested in 1975 at a time when I had long hair and I played guitar in a rock and roll band. I didn't smoke marijuana. Uh, some of my band members did and they targeted the house that we were playing at in order to raid it and make a, a demonstration in my town. Um, I don't think looking back, although I had some uh, severe problems at the time, um, looking back, I did manage to get into law school and pass the bar. So. Uh, I came out okay. I don't think that I would fit the definition of anybody's intent here of having some socioeconomic disadvantage. But I know a Vermonter who was a, on the path to being a 30 year um, employee of the United States and three years before his retirement was uh, popped on a, a marijuana charge. And as a result, they not only fired him, they deprived him of his pension. Um, now he's a white guy. And I think he would have at least the way I had understood this, he would have an argument to make that he should fall into the definition of having a socioeconomic uh, impact. So I, I'm wrestling with how do you do this 
um, and not have people uh, becoming upset because they've been deprived of at least making that argument. And I don't, I haven't read, um, I think you said it was H414, um, but it seems to me that this discussion is a lengthy one. And my frustration is I'm not sure how this committee is going to be able to resolve it in the limited amount of time that we have left. And so I, I want you to know that what you described kindly as being emphatic still comes back to my exasperation. It is a conversation that should be had, decisions should be made, um, but I don't wanna leave people at the end of the day who might have a valid argument to make being deprived of making the argument to the CDC um, just because of the color of their skin. That would disturb me greatly unless we are taking this as solely an issue of systemic racism and eliminating everything else from the equation. Um, and I think that's where Philip wants to go if I if, am hearing him correctly, but it would be hard for me to support that concept knowing that Vermont's population was so heavily dominated by white folks. And at the same time, um, they have had a socioeconomic impact in some situations and I, I don't understand why they would be deprived of making the argument that we're trying to advance here. I appreciate that. You've got an awful lot that people have thrown at you and I um, hopefully you can give us some thoughts. M maybe well, the house can correct it all. <laughs> that's, that's why we're in, that's why we're in Senate Judiciary because here you you can fix everything. So as long as I'm as long as I'm here, you know we will. Before I leave, this will all be resolved. In fact, so will so will world hunger. <clears throat> yeah. So I want to I, I want to go back briefly um, to uh, Senator um, um, Benning's uh, last statement um, because um, I think it's really important <laughs> um, before we get to Baby Ruth, and it all interconnects. And, and I think some of, the, some of this, you know, quite frankly and respectfully is, is education. Um, it is. I, I, think, I think there's some, um, there's a couple blind spots uh, that, that we all uh, wrestle with. I, you know, and yeah, you know, you can talk about uh, systemic racism um, and you can talk about correcting it uh, in ways uh, that don't necessarily um, specifically point out race. Uh, I think we, um, I think there's ways you can do it where it points out race in addition uh, to other things. I think Senator Benny, you know uh, that, um, and I am in agreement with uh, Blaine and Skyler uh, from last uh, week as far as uh, what we should uh, try to, to do, but we would, we would have a different argument if that were the case. And it, it may be from another demographic, it may be from another group of folks, but we'd have a different argument. What the United States um, has been able to do governmentally and skillfully and probably starting uh, as recent as uh, Nixon and mastered by Reagan is, is to talk about race without talking about race. Um, the other thing, and, and also to create discriminatory practices that, that, um, that, that hold people back uh, without necessarily talking about race. Um, I, I think we all know and understand that. We also know and understand that as recent as uh, Fisher versus Texas. Um, that the Fourteenth Amendment um, will, you know, create some problems in this conversation. I think nobody knows this better than Senator Benny. Um, so when when we start having conversations, and you know, we do know when, when we start looking at what happened down there in Texas, is we do know that race can be considered as one of some of the criteria that one can consider in making a decision like this. So there's no there's nothing wrong with us in, in doing so. But but what we but what we also know and understand, and this is what the courts will support, is is when we start doing this work, uh, when somebody comes at us sideways and tries to to peel this thing apart, you know, we got to have something to stand on. And I think that because we know what systemic racism has created in this nation, we know that most black people are poor. We also know that most poor people are white. So. There's there there are descriptors in here that that gets that gets at the problem and yes I do think we should we definitely need to add you know 
an additional descriptor that speaks to uh, you know American descendants of slavery and 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 also the further group of um, Black and Indigenous and and, and other uh, people of color uh, as one of the criteria in 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 this policy in this policy. Um, but yeah, I I think that um, the language is here, uh, the definitions are here. And I think before we went down this road, um, what I was really trying to state more than anything is, is that it is important that we try to do as much of this work in um, providing uh, clarifying language in terms of definitions and also identifying objectives in terms of uh, racial equity uh, on the upfront legislatively, as opposed to deferring to a, 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 um, a three panel, a three person group of folks appointed by the governor um, later on down the road to make some of these really heavy decisions. Now this also pertains to ag as well. Uh, so when, we, when we're talking about, you know, who's making decisions on qualifications, who's making decisions on access, um, and I think we're almost there, I guess, is what I'm telling you. And, I'm, and I, I see this arbitrary deadline here on the 12th coming up. Um, I don't know if there's any money in this, maybe it's the 19th, but, but this, I see that coming up, but I think we have everything that we need in front of us uh, to make some of these decisions. I see that, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, that there, there's, a, there's a, an opportunity for us to incorporate uh, some language uh, surrounding definitions um, there's an opportunity for us to incorporate in this policy some programmatic language that came out of Illinois, as Senator Nitka had referred to as well, and to be able to get some of this work done on the upfront. Maybe we can leave some latitude for the CCB to potentially modify some of this work at the recommendation of the advisors uh, later on down the road. But I think we have the structure in place. Um, at this stage in the game, we, I think we have the language uh, to insert in this bill uh, to make sure you know that we can that we can meet the governor on this and that that we can uh, get some work done legislatively um, that will um, that will satisfy uh, these um, these equity these equity uh, um, um, desires that that the, that this committee and, and those of us who are in our commit our our constituency share. Um, so I I will you know, spare you from going back through this policy because we've been through this policy before and, and Senator Sears had indicated that he hadn't seen um, the H414, but we actually, a vast majority of it, um, and Michelle would have to correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I do believe that H414 is was largely the draft policy that we reviewed last time I was here. Thank you. Senator White. Could I, I just, um... This has um, gotten me more and more confused because when I read the definitions that were in, and I don't, I don't have 414, so I don't know how it's changed, but in the draft that I had, the, the definitions, the impacted area is, is really all of Vermont. It's, um, if you look at the, there's um, five different um, um, criteria for an impacted area. And that really probably only leaves out um, the hill in um, Burlington. Every, every place else is really part of um, one of these areas. And then if you look at member of impacted family and, and the criteria for- um, Sorry, can, you, can, I just, uh, uh, can I just find that first? Uh, so you're saying yeah, that the, on the, the on the draft On the draft, it's on page, the five is the impacted area, page five, and on the- uh, draft, um, the page four is, yeah, page three and four. So if you look at the qualified equity applicant, it means somebody mm -hmm. that's resided in one of these areas mm -hmm. and who is a member of an impacted family or has been arrested for or convicted of an expungible crime. That means that Joe Benning would be considered one of these impact one of these social equity applicants or his yeah. daughter would be because he lives mm -hmm. my guess is that um the 
say uh, Lindenville is either a Vermont opportunity zone or 75% of the children are um, in federal lunch program or 20% of the uh, residents get uh, food stamps. And he has been, he was arrested for an expungable crime. So he would be eligible as would his daughter or his wife to be considered a social equity applicant. And I know plenty of people who fit into that category of having been arrested, maybe not even convicted, but they were arrested for an expungible um, crime and they live in one of these areas, but they in no way should they be considered a social equity applicant. So how do we get this down so that we're really, uh, and this is what I think one of the problems was in Illinois is that they had the language, but they didn't, it wasn't tight enough that they had all these people who qualified. And how, how do we get this tight enough so that, and I, and I don't think it should be just race. I think race should be one of the, one of the components, but there are plenty of poor white kids from Vermont who were arrested and who have been impacted dramatically. So how do, how do we do this without allowing, and I'm not picking on Joe or his daughter, but because I, I don't feel con comfortable naming me. other people, but. Um. <laughs> well, I think that I, I've given a lot of thought to this and I've tried to not get too afraid of what I'm about to say, but um, mm -hmm. I, I think what we're really talking about and what you're talking about, Senator Roy, mm -hmm. are racial and cultural minorities. Mm -hmm. um, people, you know, I, I'm thinking of some of the towns that I represent. <clears throat> They're very, um, well, without identifying the community, um, there was an industry in that community that resulted in a number of trailer parks in the community, and people moved into those homes and then when the industry left the parks were still there and very low income people some of them were um, people who had um, who were racial minorities some of them were certainly considered cultural minorities I don't know how you define that but I think that's what you're looking at and I, and I realize I may be using terms that are old-fashioned or whatever but I, really when you talk about um, it gets to making sure that we're not defining. Um, I, I think you have to use those terms. Uh, without, I, without using the racial term, um, minority, I don't think. You, I, I think you can say race is yeah. one of the components. That's, I yes, think you can but do the, that. The second part is how do you um, make sure that these folks were um, disproportionately um, impacted by cannabis prohibition. And how do you define who those people are? Because they primarily were poor kids, rural poor yeah, kids. Right. Well, or I'm... kids from St. Albans, because if you read um, whatever that book was that, um, uh, I, mean, I can't Paul think of Lawrence? Yeah. Paul, yeah. I mean, if you, a bunch of those kids were certainly impacted. Right. And um, so, how do you how do you define who those people are without saying it's some, the poor kids? Some well, define themselves. Uh, I mean, certainly some could define themselves. I can think of a former member of the House of Representatives who is a Rutland County person who was picked up in that Paul Lawrence scandal, and it was a major major deal. I know several of them who were. Right. I meant, how do you define it well, so that you keep out those other people, like Joe and his daughter? Right. And well, the people we, that I'm referring to. I mean, well, maybe that's the struggle. Do we let people self define? I mean, we've got, how are you going to sort this out? I don't know. That's other what than, I'm asking. Other than the things that Mark had said very directly to put in. Mark, it must be frustrating for you to listen to this. Well, I'm, I'm getting used to it. I'm, I've, uh -huh. I've been at this for a little bit. But I, I think that, um, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a good conversation. It's being broadcasted. It's being recorded, and 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 there's a um there's a lot of stuff that 
my my senators are unpacking here, and I, I think I think that's important. And, and I'm starting to learn that some of this is part of the process. Uh, the process is 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 uh, is important. Um, I thought I'd never say that, but um, here we are. I, I think that um, the um, you know this this is a teachable moment, though. I, I do think you know I think that you know when we we go into our prisons and we see that our prisons are 11 percent you know black folks. And when there was 1.4 percent um, black folks in the state, and and with the high uh, conviction rate or the uh, the um, the um, te technical, uh, you know, getting hit on uh, technicals with uh, with marijuana uh, historically, uh, not just now but over time. And then if you look at the nation, because again, we're not just talking about Vermont; we're talking about the nation because we just already established that people come here from all over the place. We talk about what marijuana has historically and is continuing to do to black and brown folks uh, across the United States. You know, we, we've got to contextualize this conversation. And you know, I said earlier that most black people are poor and most poor people are um, are white. But you have to, you know, I, you have to think about what the term disproportionate means. You know, it's very important. You know, to have that conversation. You know, we can always find find something that's anomalous. Um, uh, Senator Benning, with all due respect, you are anomalous. The situation that you encountered as a as a state senator, as a qualified and competent attorney, having encountered what you encounter, you are you are you are that is an anomaly. Um, I have a rich brother; he's an anomaly. So I think that I quite quite frankly, um, you know, we spend too much time in these conversations talking about anomalous circumstances. You know, when we ought to be talking about, you know, what is his, what is historically disproportionate, you know, and if we can, we can't sit here and forget about 1865, you know, we can't sit here and forget about who we are as a nation and what the so-called justice system has done to people of color and how marijuana has played a role in that. Um, so yes, I do, again, I'll go back to the point I was making, I, I think it is important that we do um, include race in, um, in these uh, definitions. Um, and it is one of the criteria. And who knows, maybe some white people might slip in this because they've also been disproportionately impacted. This is not an exercise of trying to figure out how to keep white people out. It's an exercise of trying to make sure that we address those who are disproportionately impacted. And yes, our target is those folks who are American descendants of slaves and folks who are black, indigenous, and other people of color. Why? Because that is what the system has historically disproportionately impacted. Those are the facts. So I think that um, that's what this policy is designed for. I think that you know, it, if you were to say, uh, by looking at this policy, that the entire state, if you were to say, and I were to agree, that this that this policy addresses the entire state, then I would you know if we were to agree on that, then I would say good one down, forty nine to go. So um, and here's the here's the other fact is is that you know that criteria is you know must be held in combination with other criteria, and we must look very closely at how that criteria, how that definition is used throughout this policy, because it's not used throughout this policy as the criteria to qualify anyone for anything, okay? It is a criteria. Um, so I think we need to look closely at the policy and let's be careful not to explain the policy away before we uh, do the deep analysis that's okay. necessary. If we, if we don't have time to do the deep analysis now to Senator Bidding's point, um, then let's continue to do the deep analysis. Uh, let's take responsibility for it, but let's not put it on there. Let's not put it on the control board because we're going to get a what I believe is a a poorer outcome if we kick this one if we put this one. Right. Okay, so historically is a key word. No. Disproportionately impacted is a key word, and um, so I think we need to come up with better wording. Um, I'm going back to section three in the bill. Um, Okay, you're in the um, bill. I'm in. In as introduced. In the bill as introduced. That's twenty-five. 
It has the term historically been have been disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition. It has that twice. And obviously those who seek to participate in a regulated cannabis market. <clears throat> um, so I think, okay. and Michelle, as we play with the wording here, I think we need to have race be a part of that definition. Um, racial, uh, however you want to put it, however, that's, you know, we already have seen it before. So it's, um, but I think we're also talking about people, other individuals who may, um, socioeconomic or whatever, have been also disproportionately impacted by cannabis. Nope. Am I off? Did I go off the res? Did I go off no. here? No. What this if, is what we're talking about. What What if we? Um, I mean, I think there's going to be some confusion here about we're putting something in, and then H14 is going through the house, and they're going to come up with some that's, definitions. That, that, I and can't stuff. deal with what what the house <laughs> I, does. I know. Um, so the house will, I, I can't call them any names, but they I know, I know. Will do what they do. So my well, you can, but only I get in trouble. I, I, I realize that, Senator Benning. My suggestion here is I don't know if this makes any sense or not, but can we expand this just a little bit to include race in here? Yes. And um, socioeconomic status, and then, yes. and then tell the board more specifically to work with, and we can name groups that they need to work with to come up with clear definitions and um, criteria. Because if we just say those things, that sets the um, direction for them but then we define certain groups that they need to work with in a subcommittee to come up with some more detail around it. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Yeah, okay. so if I was wording three, section three, I would have whatever we come up with and I think it's better to move on from this now and, and to try to come up with some wording and um, the next time we take the bill up. But right now I'd like to consider reduced or uh, reduced licensing fees and low low or no interest loans. Mm -hmm. um, to, yeah. uh, these groups, so that's in B. And then I wanna discuss the idea of a certain amount of the revenue up to $10 million going into um, I know some of you didn't like that idea from Senator Bond's bill, but I Mr. Chair? Yes. I'll, I'll um, I will say as a general idea when when the bill passed and the governor allowed it to become law um it committed a couple of streams of revenue, one to substance abuse treatment and one to after school programs. I would support both of those. I, I think they're both worthy, um, but I, I wish the process hadn't pre-committed those streams because I think to the extent possible, it makes, uh, oops, sorry. Sorry about that. Well, uh, I didn't, I didn't. Oh, I, it was my phone going through my headphones. Oh, no. um, I think to the extent possible, it makes sense to have one coherent discussion about where the money should go, um, as we do in the money committees, where you're, you're able to judge things against one another and make a coherent decision. So if having committed two revenue streams, we in this bill commit another one, what we're doing is piece by piece, we're, we're leaving less and less to have that important discussion about the, the big needs we have in the state. I understand. Um, so um, not to downplay this need, but to say it should take place in the context 
and sit beside other needs. Okay, but I would say that we already crossed that Rubicon when we passed the bill with money in it for um, substance misuse and the after school one, blah, blah, blah. And it seems to me that signaling 20% or $10 million um, either in the way, you know, in the way it is in on page two of Senator Rahm's proposal or any other proposal, but 20% of the revenues, and I was going to say up to $10 million, um, be used for criminal justice counsel in conjunction with Racial Justice Alliance, Migrant Justice, National NAACP, uh, municipalities in Vermont to engage in community-based process related to policing and public safety, prioritizing uh, for communities that seek to reduce their police force and transition funding away from policing, those other personal and programming that can need it, put in any wording you want, but it would go to um, dealing with some of these um, significant problems that we've discussed. Uh, <clears throat> that was my idea. Um, that would be C. Um, you don't want to, that's not popular with the rest of it. I, I um, disagree with that. I agree with Philip that we should not be um, specifying more funds. And if we do put some funds into it, what this, um, our committee is looking this afternoon at um, the, what was suggested by um, in Representative China's um, proposal, which is a cannabis business development fund that would go for technical assistance and small and uh, loans. Um, it would be um, for the technical um, advice, business advice and loans to people. That's very different than um, money for um, communities who want to transition away from policing. And I think uh, that- I didn't say transition away from policing. That's Please. what the amendment says. That's what her amendment says. Well, that's not what I would have in mind. But so anyway, we are, I, I do not yeah. think that we should, um, um, I, I'm fine with doing an upfront amount into the, a business um, loan, a business fund, whatever we want to call it, for loans and grants and right. um, to individuals, yeah. but not to communities, but to individuals who are the some of the impacted individuals. That's where I would think we need to look. Jeanette, can I ask where you would get that money from? Well, we're suggesting an upfront, and I think I suggested that um, before just an up, upfront appropriation this year to get it to set up the fund and get it started so that people can yeah, begin okay. to get technical assistance and loans and grants. And then um, there was a suggestion that um, a percentage of the sales from the dispensaries go into that fund up to a certain amount. So we're looking at that that was in both proposals. And then um, ongoing, it would be um, come through the appropriations um, process, just as funds for how much we put into loan forgiveness for nurses comes through the appropriations process. And so there would be an appropriation that would be put in there. And um, it, it could even at some point be a revolving loan fund for those people who find that they can pay it back or it could be um, grants if that's okay. what needed. I just, uh, thank you for that. I just, um, yeah. I guess I've got to say, Dick, I'm, I'm very uncomfortable trying to add any revenue streams from what we're trying to set up here beyond what we've already sold the bill on, which was pretty specific. And it is difficult for me to, um, especially knowing how few towns have voted to actually have something established. Um, it's difficult for me to go back to uh, the folks that I've argued this bill should pass 
um, and say we're going to dilute from those law enforcement and therapeutic or um, prevention efforts that were the selling points for the bill in the first place. So I'm going to have to agree with Jeanette on that. Well, I think if, if a certain percent, I will, I will argue again, a certain percentage went towards embedding social workers in community um, leasing efforts um, would make a huge difference. I don't mean we go, we, I never intended to defund police. I do have always intended to make sure that the money is going um, and being used in looking at different ways of using that money, like social workers and others. But that isn't what the amendment says. I understand. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mark, did you have a comment? And then I'll listen to Philip. I'm sorry, Phil. Senator Baruth first, and then Mark. Yeah. Uh, if just briefly, um, I I'm not prejudging the merits of what you're talking about, Mr. Chair. It, it could be that in a in a larger discussion that rises to the top. I I'm just suggesting that there should be a plan for a larger discussion before we commit more piecemeal. Um, and that's a good question, I think, for, um, you know, we have three members here who are also on appropriations. We have the chair of government operations. Um, there, there should be a plan that we can all agree to when we have this conversation. Well, I'm um, going to tell you that one of the things that happened when the governor and the state police um, talked about having a social worker embedded in every district in the last uh, state of the state address or budget address, I can't remember which one. Local police departments contacted me saying they would love to have the ability to get grants to, to start funding that in their police departments. So um, th that's what I'm talking about. And so whatever. Um, well, I, just to surface my own um, preference there, I, I've been contacted by hundreds of people around the state college system mm -hmm. who are hoping that that will be a lifeline going forward for them. So, so we, we, child we, care wants a dedicated fund. The pensions want a dedicated yep. fund. State college want a dedicated fund. No, where, under, where does that leave? Where does that leave this? Well, it it should leave it in my in my opinion. In, in what I said, we should, we should create a moment purposefully with the right um, mix of committees to, to take a look at this problem. What, what should happen with this revenue stream? Um, Mark, thank you. I'm sorry, Bill, did I talk? No, that's, that's about it. Mark, you, you've been You know, it's, <clears throat> it's pretty frustrating. Uh, it's pretty frustrating to uh, to be having this conversation right now, um, given the history of uh, where we've come from, not just historically, but even as we even as we work to put this bill together uh, this last year, uh, couldn't seem to get a word in edgewise. Uh, there wasn't a word about systemic racism or racial equity in any of those three reports that were produced that informed as. 54 at the, at the top of last session. And uh, it was very difficult to, um, to get anyone's attention. Um, uh, it seemed that there was a, um, you know, a lot of commitment to getting this done for reasons that we understand, um, you know, because of, you know, where this, this process has come from, also because of many of the folks uh, who are, um, either uh, big cannabis or uh, folks who are um, dispensaries or folks who are uh, affiliated. And it was just a lot of power. And we saw a lot of vitriol that came from folks um, that sought to um, uh, oppose what we were putting forward this last year. So we waited um, and the governor was you know, teetering and, and he also um, agreed. And now we're at a conversation about now, um, I must frame what I'm about to say because what underpins 
um, systemic racism is is a differential on political and economic power. And now we're sitting and we're having a conversation about um, where we're gonna, how we're gonna pay for it. And this really comes down to priorities. We were trying to, we were hoping that this would have been figured out last year. And the reason why you have placeholders uh, for other yeah. things that you are paying for is, is because you prioritized it over racial equity in this process. And this, so this is much larger than you know our experience in the criminal justice system. It's it's you know the disparities that exist across all systems of state government to the extent that the median wealth of a black family is one thirteenth that of a white family and diminishing. Uh, but yet we have this conversation. You know I think that um, again I think most of this work should be done now. Uh, I think the system was not designed to accommodate it because um, there is a um, vacillating between who actually is responsible for this because uh, um, Senator White in government operations just indicated uh, and said earlier uh, that we would be talking about this in her committee later. This is, this is, um, this is that, that whole, um, um, that piece that goes into uh, uh, the um, the work that would be done uh, with um, the integrated licensing licensing rather in the um, that um, um, equity program. This is the same conversation. It's the same conversation. This it's how do you fund you know, how do you fund social equity grants? How do you fund the cannabis business development fund? These are the same conversations. One's gonna be in government ops this afternoon. We're having one now. A little while ago, and, and I said it at the top of our, um, my uh, opening statement, I told you that there's, I have confusion with that. And the reason why this is, is this, this, this system wasn't designed to accommodate a conversation on systemic racism, um, you know, I, I, I want to, um, again, urge the committee um, to, um, to take a close look at, um, it keeps being referred to as uh, Brian Chena's uh, language, but it, it's called H414 and we proposed it. Um, so there is a policy. Um, it does have the language. Uh, that suggests how to go about paying for this. It does talk, speak of transferring $200,000 into the cannabis registration fee fund. Uh, it, it speaks of 10% um, of revenues raised by the cannabis excise tax, uh, not to exceed $2 million. Uh, it goes into um, you know, the work that Senator White was gonna, is going to be um, take it up in her committee this afternoon on integrated licenses. It talks about um, those um, fees that would go into that. So there, there are ways that are established whereby we can pay for this work. Um, and yes, um, representing a, you know, uh, you know, American descendants of slavery and, and, and BIPOC communities, um, it, it would be at most advantageous for us uh, for um, to have have these monies being, you know, routed into our communities for our economic development, um, and uh, you know that we're nobody's talking about um, anything else except for you know this the ability to advance economically. This is just a market. This is one market and this is one that's emerging. And um, now is the time to be able to find the money uh, to be able to create those programs. And I think that there is a framework that's right here in front of us in H414 that establishes that. So I, I, I hope that you take a closer look at that and, uh, and consider it. And I will be in testimony this afternoon to talk more about it as well, if that's what I need to do. Thank you, Mark. Um, moving on, um, I was really anxiously await what happens in government operations. <clears throat> Section five of the bill um, has to do with the criminal justice, my criminal justice council.
that the A ride program. That's just a report. Is that okay? Yeah. Section six repeals the section, uh, and it's replaced with section seven. The substance misuse prevention funding, and this is just to put a fence around the funding so it doesn't go to other places. The language, I believe, came from joint fiscal. I'm not mistaken, and, and Michelle working together on this. So it doesn't change anything substantively from? No, it just says that they have it to carry forward um, ability so they don't spend 10 million in one year they and they have two they only spend eight and they've got two million left they can spend 12 the next year okay is that correct right it also uh codifies the language uh in <clears throat> Act 164 it was session law so um we put that codified that anthea is actually the one that works on the money provisions on the cannabis stuff for us and um so I think, and she went back and forth with, uh, with Senator Sears a bit on trying to figure out, you know, there's issues around you, you as you well know, you can't bind a future legislature. Um, and so uh, the governor had said he wanted it to be in a special fund, but the legislature did not want to do a special fund. Um, and so this is just trying to clarify, to codify it and also clarify that if there's any revenues left over that it, that it carries forward and it can't be kind of, or it shouldn't be pilfered. But it, it could be, um, not withstood in the future. Um, I would imagine so. I think you'd want to talk to one of the money team attorneys like Anthea, um, because I typically, that's not what I do day in and day out, but. Um, I well, do know, obviously, the general rule. Could, but even if a special fund can be most good, yeah. we have a special fund for the um, marijuana, uh, the um, medical marijuana um, fees go into a special <laughs> fund. And this administration took that money and used it during yeah. a deficit. So I, I don't think there's, even if you create a special fund, it doesn't mean it can't be was not yeah. yeah. Can I ask a question on another? Yep. On page six, this is page six, section three, the additional sentence between August 1st and October 22nd. What I'm interested in there is sold by an integrated licensee shall be obtained from a licensed small cultivator. Yeah, so that went along with, um, section two. Yes, I'm just wondering though, can that small cultivator be from out of state if there isn't enough being grown in Vermont? No. no. Or, or should it say a, a Vermont licensed small cultivator? Well, the, the, this only, there's no, there's no buying cannabis in another state and crossing state lines. So nothing in the whole system contemplates that. It's only, it's all when we talk about licensed uh, cannabis uh, establishments, this is talking, it's always just talking about Vermont licensed cannabis establishments. All right. I think that would probably be federally illegal. Yeah. Doesn't mean someone wouldn't do it. Well, well, it'd be a violation of both state and federal law. <laughs> Okay. Nobody would ever do that. Right. Okay. That, okay. I wish I had a gavel that could say that completes the orders of the day. <laughs> um, you can say it. Yeah. Um, Mr. What Chair. What? What? Well, I wanted, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, did somebody say something? Oh, no. It's I Mark. Just... Mark. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. I was, I was wondering, um, just briefly, I know you're getting ready to get out of here, but I didn't, I didn't feel resolved in, in, on the social equity thing. Can we, can we just kick that entire conversation to GovOps uh, with the senator's permission and come back and, uh, with how, how we flesh that out, this uh, Section 3, uh, in conjunction with the other work that uh, we're doing uh, with the- um, Absolutely. 
if it's okay with Senator White. Senator White, is that fine with you? Sure. Well, okay. I'll I, see you this I, afternoon. I, yep. Senator Baruch has a. I, Mark, framed that in a way. I just want to clarify. Uh, GovOps could bring back language to us, but it it would then be for discussion and yeah. vote vote in here. Yeah, well, that I, I understand that. I, I appreciate the clarification, and uh, you know this. I I appreciate the process. <laughs> I'll leave it there. Okay. <laughs> Glad you. you do. As far as far as the memo to agriculture, Michelle, just the sections that we just identified that are agriculture, as well as the issues that were raised by the uh, Growers Association and by Rural Vermont, we would ask them to look at those issues. <clears throat> and I, you know, we need to put, um, this bill's gotta go to finance. It's gotta go to appropriations. Uh, and, and so. um, thank you.